Eisenhower appointed John Foster Dulles to take charge of foreign policy. To him, anti-communism and American big business were two sides of the same coin. One night at the Iranian embassy, the then ambassador Saleh and myself talked to John Foster Dulles. And John Foster Dulles made it very clear that Iran will not be allowed to get away with the nationalization. And his argument was that if we get let you get away, then what's going to happen to Kuwait, to Saudi Arabia, to Iraq, and all our American holdings all over the world. That was Encouraged by the response of the Americans, MI6 set up a team in Cyprus to keep in radio contact with the Rashidian brothers in Tehran. They had a very wide range of contacts, particularly in the bazaar, and the moneyed or hopefully moneyed classes were getting worried. They saw that their prosperity was being threatened and opinion was building up among those classes against Mossadegh and they also had contacts with the Ayatollahs and a sort of merchant religious movement going through to the people and a little bit of renter crowd should have provided a strong popular demonstration against Mossadegh and in favor of the Shah. Sir Sam Fall of the British Embassy in Tehran. Central to the Rashidians' network were the mob leaders based in the traditional athletic clubs, where physical prowess and protection rackets went hand in hand. Here could be found men in the pay of Iran's ruling class, who could provide the renter crowd the British needed. The British pinned their hopes above all on the Shah. To their dismay and that of Iran's elite, Mossadegh's reforms were reducing his powers to those of a ceremonial monarch rather than a ruler. The Shah was exceedingly weak. He was vacillating and he was afraid and he just didn't know what to do. He didn't like Mossadegh. He realized that Mossadegh was threatening his position that he was unable to screw up the courage needed to dispose of Mossadegh. Although the Shah failed to act, the British kept trying. In March 1953, with Britain's agents fanning the flames, a hired mob called for Mossadegh's blood. Intrigues grew as the politics of the street took over and Mossadegh's supporters rallied to his defense. His moderate allies in Parliament were now deserting him, but he was supported for the first time by the communist-backed two-day party, a development the CIA played on in their propaganda. What we did from Washington was to write some of the articles that would appear in the Persian press. And these articles would appear, thanks again to the Rashidians, who had contacts, I believe, with probably four-fifths of the Iranian press. And any article that I would write, it gave you something of a sense of power, would appear almost instantly uh, the next day in the Iranian press. And they were designed to show Mossadegh as a communist collaborator and as a fanatic, as a person who uh, didn't understand that you could be both nationalistic and positive. Former CIA agent Richard Cotton. When we bedridden old Mossadegh has trouble with the majlis or parliament, he goes to the people for a referendum to have it dissolved. But more than 100,000 citizens of Tehran, including every available member of the Communist Two-Day Party, turn out to vote yes and be marked with indelible ink, so they won't vote again. Understandably, few oppose the skinny old man who controls the army and the police. And the supervisors at the opposition voting place have nothing to supervise. Mossadegh, who is not a communist, has won with communist support. Can he now get rid of his dangerous new friends? This is Mehdi Tarani, youth organizer of the Tuda Party. He said our members were Democrats, anti-fascists, intellectuals, even the military and the party. None of us wanted to overthrow Mossadegh because we were patriots ourselves, nationalists. This is Fuad Rahimi, legal advisor to the National Iran Oil Company. Communism. That was, you know, the communist bogey which was uh, represented to the, to the United States and was the cause of the United States' action in removing Mossadegh. 
I think that also was totally wrong. Mossadegh was not going towards co communism. Mossadegh had uh, two complexes. One was that he had a martyr complex, that if I die, I die for my country, or if I am jailed, I jailed for my country, that's an honor. The second was that he depended so much on the people. He was a kind of the populist pe person that he said, people always will protect me. And as long as I have the people, nobody can have a coup d'etat against me. Nasrallah Fatemi, Iranian delegate to the UN. And I guess that, that was, uh, the, the reason that he neglected everything, and even when the coup d'etat came, he didn't do anything about it. In August 1953, Britain and America were ready to act. The American ambassador was recalled to avoid implication. An American agent persuaded the Shah to sign this decree and arranged an army unit to deliver it to Mossadegh. The original coup plan was based on the, the fact that the Shah had the ability to dismiss a government. CIA agent Richard And Cartman. therefore, what was going to take place was that an officer in the army would take a firman, a, a notice, to the to Mossadegh and inform him that he had been replaced and that General Zahadi would become prime minister. Le 25, à minuit. This is Shakur Bakhtiar, which ended, he ended up being assassinated by Iranian agents. He said tanks and machine guns arrived at midnight. Colonel Nasiri of the Royal Guard told Mossadegh he was dismissed. Mossadegh wrote on the decree, received, I will decide. They had no right to come with tanks demanding the prime minister's resignation. Mossadegh should have acted immediately and had them all shot. Aurait dû agir immédiatement et faire fusiller le lendemain par la loi martiale tous ceux qui ont été inclus dans cette histoire. When news of the attempted coup was heard, Mossadegh supporters took to the streets, venting their anger on symbols of royalty. The Shah himself fled the country, but the CIA did not give up. They looked for a way to turn the protests to their advantage. This is Mehdi Tirani, youth organizer, two Party. He said, we all went to the Central Square in Tehran. It was one of the two Party's biggest demonstrations. It was against U.S. intervention and for Mossadegh nationalist government. They even called for a people's republic. Die haben für eine Republik sogar ja, sich ausgesprochen. Die haben die Parole des Volksrepublik ausgesprochen. Ne? Well, as soon as this occurred, these two agents that I mentioned saw the opportunity and sent the people we had under our control into the streets and acted as if they were too dead. They were provocateurs, but we had more than, than just provocateurs. We had a lot of shock troops who actually acted as if they were two dead people throwing rocks at, uh, at mosques, at priests. With Tehran now in that chaos, was Richard the Cotton, CIA, CIA persuaded agent. the royalist army officers to try again. Brandishing copies of the Shah's decree, they advanced towards Mossadegh's house. Meanwhile, the Rashidians and their friends mobilized their mobs to do battle with Mossadegh's supporters. That mob that came into North Tehran and was decisive in the overthrow was a mercenary mob, had no ideology. And that mob was paid for by American dollars. And the amount of money that was used is, it has to have been very large. There were lots of people in the streets, uh, standing on the pavements and wondering what was happening. There was lots of, in fact, uh, talk and conversation and uh, debate, etc., as well as speculation. And uh, uh, I saw uh, a few uh, lorry loads of uh, people, uh, people standing in these uh, lorries, looking like rockets and thugs, uh, carrying clubs and sticks, and shouting slogans against Mossadegh and uh, occasionally in favor of the Shah. Uh, that was well, what, what, what was happening in the morning. We didn't take it very seriously. We knew that, that there was something uh, wrong, but we thought perhaps that uh, things would uh, turn the other way. But in the afternoon, uh, it became clear that uh, things were much more serious, and the news came that Mossadegh's home had been surrendered. Gradually. Uh, the shooting started, and I told him, sir, I This is Mossadegh's aide, Ali Reza Sahib. He said, no, 
if it's going to happen, if it is going to be could, uh, could it, oh, I think it's better I stay in this room and I die in this room and I will never uh, live here.